Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Star Switching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven. I'm here with my very special guest this evening, Dr. Richard Allen Miller. And you with me? Dr. Miller? Yes, I am. Oh, yes, my. I am. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you on tonight, as I always. I was reading something trying to get up to speed on Element 115, which I don't know much about, but I was trying to read that. I've given you a few links. That's all I know about it at this point. Mostly... Okay. Uh, Element 115 and Lazar studies are unconfirmed by me. Okay, so Element 151 or 115? One, oh, that's 115, sorry. Okay. 151 is the one he's supposed to be. But 115 is, yes, thank you for making that. Um, what we do have, Boeing has, is a magnetic monopole. And that I can talk about because I actually I understand how it works. Um, I do not understand how element 151 works. I was looking at element 115, which is a little different. And uh, there is a whole series of new discoveries that are happening in the periodic chart. But uh, there are other periodic charts than the one that Mendeleev developed. And so isn't that interesting? in terms of possibilities of undiscovered uh, elements. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it all means at this point. It makes a good science fiction story, oh, yeah. and I don't know Bob Lazar, so I can't comment on that. Okay. Well, thank you for that, and thank you for the questions in the chat also. Well, you know, it all boils down to alchemy. You're dealing with alchemy on a very high level, activated through frequency. Anytime you're looking at these these elements in general, it's all they're all switched on through frequency, if you ask me. There are um, relationships of different particles in relationship to each other, just like water and structured water. You know, just water as, an L, as, a, as a molecule is an extremely uh, interesting and yet to be discovered properties uh, with structured water and its relationship when it touches something else. It's interesting has a memory form to it. It responds to everything that it touches differently, which means that just by looking at what's happening to the water, you know what it's touching. Now that is a computer chip that is six zeros more efficient than our current gallium arsenide and forbidden zones. We call these exclusion zones or easy water and uh, and the register for information is a million times more efficient. Exactly. That means that, you know, water in your body could contain past and future lives. Mm -hmm. Oh, it does. Cellular, once again, cellular recall. And they know this. I believe that there are a lot of parties that be that do the uh, covert, you know, technological, you know, whatever you want to call it, experimentation programs. They, they know damn well what's going on. And they understand that we are complex beings in multidimensional suits literally, um, that can be accessible. And we literally can access a lot of different databases if we so choose, once again. And coming from your perspective and doing the work that you do as a magician, um, obviously you're able to do that, right? Uh, <laughs> stay tuned <laughs> on that. Uh, you know, that would be the theory of why Crowley called it theory and practice. It <laughs> the theory sometimes doesn't fit the practice, and so it's a process of trying to get better and better at it. Right. Magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. And so, in some sense, altered states of consciousness are God's gift to man in having free will. And, you know, the ability to go and design, you know, design anything. And I think it's water that is where psyche becomes matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's where your thought is somehow transferred through the systems of water in your body and projected into the physical world that it creates our reality. It makes sense because it's a conductor, so that would transmit the uh, and matter is energy, so it would make perfect sense on a scientific level. Well, yes and no. Did you know they closed Jerry Pollock down? Mm -mm, no. What happened? That's, yeah, the he is Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington. He was the man that hired me for military in 1970. Jerry was my lead. And I worked under Jerry. I didn't work for Jerry. I was around the corner with higher security clearances, boys from Brazil, 
But Jerry was the person that when I needed a Bridgeport Mill or something, he would go get it. Now, Jerry's book, The Fourth Phase of Water, is exceptional. And uh, today, this is 45 years later, he hired me in 1970. Oh. <laughs> so I've known Jerry for 45 years. And Jerry was is now Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington in anesthesiology. Anesthesiology is the highest form of medicine there is. It's even over above brain surgery. This is where all the spooky work goes on. And Jerry is Professor Emeritus. And what the School of Medicine did at the University of Washington is took his laboratory and put four more desks in there. So he has no laboratory space anymore and he can't do research. That's what they did to Jerry. Now, other people that are really important in the world of structured water would be include Rustam Roy at Penn State and Mark LeClaire at MIT. And Jerry, in my opinion, is the leader. He's the one that puts on the seminars. Some of the best work ever done in water was, was uh, Alex Kavarainen, who is now dead. He was a Finnish physicist, and his work in structured water is exemplary. Matty Pitkinen, who is a currently... Uh, his protege is out working, you know, in that field somewhat. They're from Finland. Uh, there are other works going on in, in that field that I think are, you know, worth mention. But Rustam Roy is the one that is talking about the nature of homeopathy, where a small drop of something will change the entire memory system inside liquids. And uh, we call that homeopathy, where we take a, you know, a small dose of something, and because it's so small, it restructures everything around it. <laughs> One of the things I did for seals when I was training seals was to carry baking soda, just a small pinch in a glass of water, restructured it, and made it you know, accessible to digest the process just by changing the pH, things of that nature. That's interesting. Well, you know, it, when you're talking about these things, uh, you know, universal transmissions alter the DNA as well. So you're you're still dealing with frequency in every form of design, whether it's through um, a transmission and frequency or water. It's all the same, in my opinion. It's still about vibration. You still want to look at how the transport process works of transferring mm-hmm. information from one subsystem to another. Right. And actually sitting down at a table and saying prayer changes everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. why rituals are the celebration of a myth and why the little rituals that we do like that are so extremely important in terms of how they structure our physical reality. Yep, I agree. And that's why they're being attacked at this point in the continuum, too. And the brain and the mind is being attacked. I mean, there is a, there's definitely a war going on through that. Um, and we have to tell you that, that there's a lot going on behind the scenes, which is about con- controlling and manipulating the masses and, and everyone's thoughts and where they spend their days and thoughts. And of course, that's that's huge because once you control the masses, you can control the false matrix. Well, when I heard that this interviewer had interviewed, what is it, Tom, uh, Michael Aquino, uh, who's a major general, I think, in the Air Force, or Army, he's in the Army, um, works for NSA now, uh, had formed the Temple of Set and was talking about mind wars. Mm -hmm. And so now they've asked me possibly to discuss the early mind wars because that's a paper I've actually written and participated in. That's why I got my talisman out. (laughs) If I'm going to have to go into an arena with a bunch of magicians, I better at least... Oh, you'll be fine. (laughs) Need backup, I can help you out. I'm pretty good at that sort of thing. You know, it's real interesting now. Now, Colonel Michael Aquino, he used to be a colonel, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Um... Sorry, yeah. He's okay. stuff, yeah. He is head of the NSA or he is involved in NSA. That's for real, huh? Yeah, there's all kinds of things that he's involved That's just that freaking like amazing to me. That slays yeah. me, really. Well, it's uh, freedom of religion. There's nothing well, wrong with that. No, it's and not actually, that part. It's the psychotronic warfare program that I'm talking about. It's the electromagnetic electronic warfare, The, the all the yeah. crap that I was exposed to, you know, the induction programs they use with uh, 
interface with artificial telepathy that you've written articles on as well. So, so literally, we're talking about somebody who has access and has been manipulating the brain and now is acquiring NSA access, which means he can, you know, pretty much give these guys a heads up as far as what to do with the, with the mass. Well, they've control. now got a new gunslinger in town. They just made me a GS-18 again. And well, so congratulations. What does that oh, mean? Well, <laughs> watch me <laughs> shoot him up. <laughs> what does that mean? Tell me. It means that I'm an equivalent to a two-star general in civilian clothes. Hey, I love it. That's well, great. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you whether or not that works for me. So what can, what can that do for us? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I actually know that I don't know. And that's the scary part of this all, is that there are things going around me that I don't get yet. And I'm smart, and I'll hopefully at some point sort it out. But right now, I know that I don't know. Let's take some of your questions. If there's groups, I love to field questions. That's what I do best is tangent all over the place. Okay, I think we have a lot of questions in here. <laughs> let, me, let me, you know, the, the biggest challenge is copying these things and pasting them as they're yeah, in the chat. Yeah. Let's but, you know, that's, if they're interested enough to want to hear what I have to say, I am interested enough to know what they want to hear about. I think that's very important. And um, hang on for a second here. Let's see. We have asked Mr. Dr. Miller about uh, quantum commands to politely tell the universe what you want in your heart and receive anything if you are capable of handling it. So... Yes. What do you mean? I don't understand. What All right, I'm going to type it out for you because. Um, yeah. 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 There you go. It out in simpler language. I'll let you read it. Okay. Uh, quantum commands to politely tell the universe to uh, go stick it. Yeah. <laughs> My heart. Uh, actually, I have a, a relationship to myself that is so wonderful that when I'm thinking something wrong, I have a metaphor that will come in and wake me up to, to what I should be doing. Um, basically, I guess the universe will never do anything to you that you're not capable of handling, including my, the death of my little girl in my arms with leukemia. I didn't think I could do that. Here I am. And I had good closings with her. So when you have challenges, I'm going to guess from a metaphor point of view, you have previously agreed to do this. And you have choices on how you go about setting up this, this command. You can do it kicking and screaming, which means it causes karma. Or you can let it flow where the mountain comes to Buddha. Now, you have that choice. And how you choose to do it is your choice of how much more pain or suffering you want to include in that. Let me give you, yes, I know Bob Wilson. Robert Anton Wilson was one of my best friends. I'm the guy that brought him into OTO. His daughter, Tana, <laughs> was the one that went with me to, with the writ of habeas corpus to Vacaville, and they had to release Timothy Leary. So Bob Wilson, I knew him when he was still a stringer at uh, All Hail Eris, All Hail Kalisti, <laughs> and H.P. Lovecraft. What do you think about H.P. Lovecraft? Are we talking about the writer from the 30s or the rock and roll group from the 60s out of New York City? H.P. Lovecraft, the band, did a thing called At the Mountains of Madness that is absolutely as good as Ultimate Spinach. Yes, I'm that old. And I grew up with all of these people. Bob um, knew um, oh, some of the uh, uh, Solar Lodge down in L.A. Um, I, you know, Freighter Shiva, um, you know, who are some of the other ones uh, that had a little tattoo on his forehead? Oh, yeah, Charles Manson. Yeah, oh, some of those guys. <laughs> I knew Lee Heflin and... Uh, of course, I studied personally with Stanfield Jones. That was my teacher. Uh, and then Phyllis Seckler, Mildred Burlingame, and Helen Parsons Smith were also my teachers, as well as Robert Anton Wilson. He was out of L.A. mostly, and his daughter lived up in San Francisco. Excellent. That's a long, long time ago. Yes, I knew Robert Anton Wilson. He has, I'm Simon Moon. 
in some of his books on Illuminati. I'm the guy that was out teaching the young girls how to do sex magic. <laughs> oh, you dirty old I man. I was you. a bad, bad boy when I was like. <laughs> and no, you, what? You, know, you were? You were, Richard? I had a lot of color, you know, living color. That was, um, who wrote that? Um, <clears throat> Real Magic. As uh, uh, a friend of mine at Berkeley wrote a book called Real Magic, and he had a chapter called Black Magic, White Magic, and Living Color. The Isaac Bonwitz. Bonwitz uh, later ran the Druids out of New York City until he died. He was also editor at one point for Carl Wyshewski at Llewellyn doing Gnostic News. So all of this was all a big soup back in the early, early 70s when I was wow. doing military. I was in the center of all of that because that's what I did. Excellent. There's another question here for you. Um, ask Dr. Miller what he thinks about the magic portrayed in the pop media like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no comment. <laughs> I don't know. I, I know. It's good for children, and I'm Dumbledore, and I'm mumbling into myself, and I don't know what I'm really doing except that I've got it all figured out. How did Kostya Nada put that? There were four enemies of man. Uh, there was, you know, fear, power, clarity, and, of course, the one I now enjoy, old age. Sure. I'm too old to do anything about it. What do I think about pop media presentation? They don't have a clue. I agree. They don't have a clue at all because, in fact, magic was reserved for the ultra elite of Europe for centuries. It was not lodges per se. These were mystery lodges. It's basically advanced physics with a mystery school. You don't really know how to really work something. There's, if you're interested in real magic now, um, you might read Laughlin, D'Aquili, and McManus in books called... Um, on cybernetic anthropology. That is approximately where we're going now in terms of how technology would go with a thumb and fire, as opposed to dolphin that do not have a thumb and do not have fire, and what would their technology be? And once you get that difference, now you can tell that there are at least four cetaceans, four mammals on this planet that are more evolved technically than men. And we don't have a clue, and we're all about to go through a cleansing, if you will, and a reboot. Well, I think it's well needed, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> Here's another question here from Mr. Rowe. Ask Dr. Mill if he ha Miller excuse me, if he had any experiences with Terrence McKenna, if you can. Yes, I did. I knew Terrence McKenna. I didn't know Terrence. I knew his brother. What happened was I was working... For Rolling Stone, they wanted me to do an, in, an interview with Terrence McKenna, and I had questions about his so-called zero-point energy. And I went to his house and knocked on his door, and he would not open his door to do that interview with me. And so I went back to San Francisco and got an old girlfriend of his from when he traveled through the jungles with him. And I brought her back so he would open the door, and he still wouldn't open the door. So I never got to interview him for Rolling Stone. I got to know his brother later over on the Big Island, but uh, I don't know either of them very well. I'm quite familiar with Terrence McKenna, of course, and some of his philosophy. So, Excellent. Yeah, you've yeah, been around. There's no doubt I, about that. I did have an opportunity to meet him. I just it didn't happen. Okay. That what? was uh, one year when Sharon Singh, no, it was Gurundar Singh that came to, uh, oh, where was it, uh, down there in Mount uh, something or other in California, Northern California. They have a, a big sun got there, and uh, Gurundar Singh came in after Sharon Singh had died, and uh, we went down to visit him, and that's when I went to try to interview um, and I think that was in the early 80s when I tried to interview uh, Terrence McKenna. Was that Mount Shasta you're talking about or no? I'm sorry? Did you say Mount Shasta? No. Okay. No, Mount Shasta. It's, um, I forget where it is. That's all right. I'll come back to you anyway, if it's yeah. supposed to. Yeah. So, so, 
over somewhere. <laughs> so so why do you think out. magic was demonized? Why do, you, why do you think mysticism and magic in general, the craft in, in any form? Well, Aleister Crowley in the 20s proposed sex magic using drugs. And actually, uh, to follow, uh, you know, drugs are an actual form of magic. They're altered state of consciousness. And so, uh, and magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. And so magic, uh, you know, drugs are right up there as a tool. However, like all shortcuts to grandma's house, there are big bad wolves. And so you have to be very careful when you take these shortcuts. Right, you can fracture the psyche, I would imagine. Well, there's all kinds of things. You're a mortal soul. There's all kinds of things that are at risk. Mm -hmm. You're not careful. Yeah. I agree with you on that one. We've got one for, I think it's Robin. Ask Dr. Miller if he went to Harvard for any time. Um, I taught at Harvard. <laughs> I taught metaphysics for 11 years with IES, Interactive Educational System out of um, down there in, um, where is it? Uh, oh, Santa, Santa Cruz. I think it was in Santa Cruz or someplace down there. IES, when PC Link was just becoming AOL, um, they had uh, their interactive educational system. It was uh, it was at uh, Humble. It was at Humble. That's where it was. It was IES, Interactive Educational System. And I taught a graduate course in metaphysics for 11 years at Harvard. And uh, several of my students, like Dr. Mack, were actual students of that course I taught in metaphysics. Advanced. And it was taught in the natural sciences. Nice. Excellent. There's a question here from Zippy. 5249, does Dr. Miller believe in AI and can it become conscious like in the Hollywood movies? Ah, I think we know yes. the that one. We have, of course, the transhumanism movement and the Avatar program. And as we move closer there, we will be closer to AI than human. Yeah, tell me about it. And there are a lot of very interesting <laughs> new science fiction stories out coming out on, on, uh, Machina and some of the other things that are, you know, about where something becomes aware. Right. Well, you know, I, I understand the concept of the transhumanism and, and also the interface with artificial intelligence. But what gets lost in the process, I think, is the question, the spiritual design, the soul's essence of origin. What gets compromised through that induction phase? Because, you know, um, it's almost like being encased in a, bo in a black box when you get interfaced with those type of devices. We don't know, actually. There's... Uh, there used to be some science fiction stories where in order to colonize the planet Saturn, we would have to engineer a type of body that could withstand those gravities and that kind of atmosphere. And that would be run from space where you were in an, an, an avatar like program where you had a, a representation. In fact, that could metaphorically be seen as to what a human body is about. And right. NASA, in their documents, actually imply such. Right. Well, that makes a lot of sense because the transhumanism, in my opinion, is creating an artificial host. And obviously, they're preparing and trying to calibrate for some kind of an anomaly, perhaps the one you're talking about, connecting in, uh, maybe maybe Nibiru. Um, perhaps this is the next phase of mankind. And it makes me kind of uh, leery because I'm really wondering what's going to get lost in the process. But but I do think that that is an artificial host that they're working on. Yeah, yeah I, I think one of the things that will get lost is the Rothschild. Good riddance. Well, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, don't, don't let the universe hit your ass on the way out, right? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, there's plenty I mean, of those. How is it that the highest one percenters seemingly also represent the least human aspects of mankind. It's ridiculous. And you know what I don't understand is how did it get so freaking out of control? I mean, I wasn't even born when all this stuff started taking place. So at what point in the continuum did this crap really start happening? I mean, where do these guys come from? They crawl out of the woodwork. They start controlling and manipulating and bullying, taking away people's patents, destroying and killing scientists who could have made a big impact. I mean, think about it. And now they're all There's out of control. There's going to be an accountability on some level, of mm -hmm. course. Absolutely there is. I mean, universal law hit them right in the butt. And I think that's what's happening. And when you're talking about all this stuff happening, you know, um, it, it could be a cataclysmic event. And maybe, and like I said before, I think we're overdue for one. I really think we need something. Something's got to give. This can't go on forever like this. This is crazy. Well, it isn't going to go on forever like this. You can count on that as the primary uh, paradigm called change. Everything <laughs> changes. That's the way it works.
I think change is good. You know, they always say make friends with change, and I'm a firm believer in that. Hopefully the change is a positive one and not necessarily, you know, something that enslaves the race of mankind. So I don't know where this is all going to go. Um, next question. Oh, wait a minute. That you're so funny. You're getting into this, aren't you? You're so cute. All What's right. That? I said, you're so cute. You're getting into these questions, aren't you, in chat? I, uh, oh, they're I, I just like, real... What's that? I like the question. That no, they're fun. Stretches my length, girth, and width. And I don't normally do this, but tonight, since everybody's active in there, I'll just go ahead and it's fine. Well, if they really want to know, I'll try they to do. do what I can. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, here... AI is, I see Turing. There's a movie, uh, you know, the Difference Engine and some of the other things he, he did. He was brilliant and defining what intelligence actually meant. And actually, there is a quantum computation algorithm in the soil called mycorrhizae, the habitat of habitat of things. Like man is a habitat. We're 10% human, and the rest of us are bacteria, viruses, molds, water transport processes, and other kinds of things. We're like a universe. And the soil in, in the ground is identically the same. It has a habitat of mycelium, Soil organisms like nematode, thrip, other kinds of things, and bacteria. And um, it forms a type of quantum computation algorithm which would denote consciousness and awareness. And there is a woman up at the University of British Columbia that talks about a mother tree in the forest that will set up a network through the mycorrhizae a communication if there's going to be a forest fire or a hurricane or a large wind going through that will, you know, somehow structurally um, compromise the forest. And there is a dialogue awareness that's different than men that has got to be in some ways more advanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's your Gaia. No, absolutely. Oh, intelligent. As a metaphor. As a metaphor. Right. Well, well, there is a, an intelligent network that goes behind the scenes. There's no doubt about that. Now, Robin asked, um, let's see here, if, if Dr. Miller thinks all his memory, like the greats, will never be lost as it is energy when he expires. <laughs> um, gonna, aren't you going to take your head and put it someplace I, else? <laughs> Go ahead. I may be remembered as Socrates, you know, as the Greek culture ends. And we have a new culture ending, beginning. I don't know how the apostle things work. I can tell you that I'm a polymath. Um, I, have n I have not reached the structure or a level of accomplishment that a Bertrand Russell has yet. But I am doing that because I'm writing my brains out. And let, let me tell you, I have a major book in draft for every single year I've been out of graduate school. And I haven't even begun to share my areas of magic and the holistic Kabbalah. Well, you better get cracking here because you only have two years. I don't need to crack. It's already done. If I don't get them published, uh, it'll be done posthumously. Trust me. Okay. I'll be like, yeah, you know, it'll happen. Excellent. <laughs> well, you know, otherwise we can transfer you into some kind of a robotic host, right? I um, later on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, how did how did he put it? I crave input. <laughs> well, that's a good one. I like that. I well, as long as it's positive some, input, right? Something informative, intelligent. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I'm. Uh, I th think that we create um, singularities, and we co and we blow them up into time bubbles, and that's what I'm doing right now. Detail. That is the resolution of a hologram. And you have your physical level, and then you have your emotional level. And, and so EQ is considered more data than IQ because it's the next level of relationship, of information to something. And so I have to give it to women and EQ and Benny Jesuits and, you know, worship the woman. <laughs> well, <laughs> we love about... you for that. <laughs> women need to be worshipped. That's yeah. right. <laughs> There's another question here in chat. Um, Soul Wonders, is CERN a time machine? I think you touched on this and you said yes. Yeah. Um, could, could they be trying to make a getaway? Obviously. No, it's not so much a getaway. My guess is, and I saw a really creepy video that was done by an occultist, and his knowledge base was almost as good as my own. I was impressed with his research, and his whole thing comes down to there's a group 
of creepy zealots trying to make biblical prophecy happen. That makes sense. Yeah. Something like a Project Blue Beam almost. Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll give you that video if you want to post it. It's really yeah. kind of creepy watching these engineers dancing around in ghost dance on oh. the platform in front of the, the CERN reactor. This, uh, this device does way more than anybody realizes in terms of the levels of energy that it's working with. And I don't know what it all means. Well, but I have enough physics to be really concerned. Right. Well, it has to be, uh, obviously, all science has to be used with wisdom and enlightenment and higher consciousness. And I don't I don't think they're there um, in consciousness yet. I, I think they're trying to be. But, you know, if they're summoning, what are they summoning? I mean, what, what are they evolved enough to even bring forth? Well, they want to bring forth the destroyer, Apollo. Yeah, well, good luck. That's it might be an entity. That, it might... what that, yeah, if you look at CERN and what its whole anachronism is about and why it got its name the way it is, it's all about Apollo. Right, okay, so... But literally, they would get an entity, not necessarily Apollo per se. This is my my point. Well, they're is, trying to create dark matter. That, right. They're trying to create a singular, a mini black, black hole. hole. There you go. That that's the is yep. Apollo that's in a, its full form. Well, you know, that's an ancient Atlantean technology, a simulation of black holes. That's, well, that's a very old technology. It, and and you know what? It's, it's all recreating itself. It's all coming into fruition again. It's all cycling well, up. There was a science fiction writer. Um, not Orson Scott Card, who was it? Um, Alan Dean Foster that wrote a very interesting science fiction story called Into the Out of. That's a worthwhile read. <laughs> it's about a shaman that watch a little slip in space open and a bunch of demons start falling out. Oh, that sounds like a Stargate. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then how do you define demon is really the, the terminology. Well, I guess demons... Uh, Actually, in magic, the first books ever written was the greater and lesser keys of Solomon. And uh, they've all through history, the various grimoires of Honorius and uh, Malachizedek and all the rest of them, they were translations of the greater and lesser keys of Solomon. In the 1800s, uh, it was broken into two books called the greater keys of Solomon and the lesser keys were called the Goetia, the fallen angels. And what it did is listed the 72 Lamegaton that fell from heaven as as demons. Now, a demon is a scalar of you. That means it's a lesser form of you, like your relationship to the sun would create a shadow. A shadow could be seen as a lesser part of you. When you make your movement, the shadow makes a movement. It is a relationship to you in a lesser form, a scalar wave, if you will. You almost that sounds like an etheric double, Richard. What's that? You almost, it almost sounds like an etheric double. No, it's lesser. It's like a shadow. It only has two dimensions, not three. Okay. Okay, it has two dimensions, not three. It would like to have three dimensions. You have four. And then an angel would be something that's more than you. And so what made us God's favorite over angels was that we had choice. The problem is, and this is where Crowley defined things as true will over free will, was that you don't have full disclosure. And because you do not have full disclosure, you do not have free will. What you have is limited disclosure which gives you true will. And this is, again, where we were going. At the end of the day, what you end up doing is your purpose. Whether you did it kicking and screaming and fighting in the world, or you flowed and allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. That's the choice you have in terms of your relationship to self. Right. Well, you know, if the um, if, if an alien observer was observing the, the, the mass collective here on the timeline, they might see them as, as demons. So that is the fourth level of the hologram, what we call the archetypal level, where you are me and I am you and I am the walrus. And you forgot the cuckoo cut you. Whatever. Well, <laughs> I usually add that in. <laughs> that, well, I'll sneeze next and you can say. Oh, OK. Yeah. Gesundheit. Excellent. And, well, and all the other German humor around that. I'll tell you, 
Um, the idea that is in my new book I'm writing called The Non-Local Mind in a Holographic Universe, How to Change the Movie. There are chapter six. It's called The Stanford Argument and the difference between intent and intentionality. And intentionality is when Maxwell Smart said to Agent 99, missed it by that much. It does not actually happen. What happens at the end of the day, at this level of consciousness, is what Aleister Crowley calls true will. And you have choices on how you do that. Right. And that's right. the internal landscape we talk about. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's another question here. Um, Mer Bailey, Dr. Miller, know about polymath and visionary Sophia Stewart, real author of Terminator Matrix? I, I am considered a polymath. I don't know Sophia Stewart. Uh, and I know that the Terminator series and Dark Horse Press is very cool. And that is, again, the constructs of the Avatar program in terms of where we may go fighting the distinctional difference between being human and a machine. Right. And, and how do you define uh, what we are versus a machine? What do you think the difference is? <laughs> the stag and the unicorn in the forest go. Soul and spirit within matter. That's my book, The Modern Alchemist. Now, that place, it means we have a mortal and immortal element. And while it's possible that machines, the body, the physical body, as we experience it, is a machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, my surgeries that I had, I didn't take herbs to fix them. I had to go in and do surgery because they were physical, structural things. I needed a new joint. Right. I replaced it with titanium. I've got titanium now in almost every limb in my body. That's <laughs> from all the wars I've seen. And I've even got a broken heart. <laughs> oh, no. I'm just kidding. Uh, but but uh, that is... To some extent, we could be seen as machines, even though we make a distinction between inanimate and animate objects and the consciousness of, that goes with that, what that actually literally means. This is why I call it the non-local mind right. in a holographic universe. In a, in a holographic universe, we have a series of minds, starting with the gut. The gut is outside space-time. If you follow your gut, now you're like a timber wolf. You're closer to spirit. You're mm -hmm. doing what you're really supposed to be doing. A wolf, when it eats little Ralphie, is not being a bad wolf. It's doing what a wolf does. Right. Little Ralphie, I like that. That's cute. That's what, that's what makes the difference between a, a, you know, spirit and soul. Right. Yeah, well, I agree. We are a, a form of almost like a symbiotic intelligent design, without a doubt. And we are compatible with machines. I hate to say it, but we are capable and compatible with machines. So, at some level, this is the goal of man, to have that integration for immortality. Well, that's interesting. I'll tell you, it's, it's going to be an interesting journey because we all know the soul is immortal. So, what you know, how can you top that? Um I guess we'll just have to see what comes out insofar as they're reverse engineered or whatever they're engineering insofar as a host or an artificial intelligent design. I was going to ask you before we wrap this up, and we have about 20 minutes, we have a pretty good amount of time here, but I do want to touch on the Jade Helm because I, it's my impression it is a PSYOP and that I think people are getting way too worked up over it. I agree and disagree. I okay. think that Gordon Duff's evaluation of it is probably correct. It is an exercise. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And I have somewhere over here what jade helm means it's creepy it comes from 1961 and uh, a state department document that uh, allows for uh, the possibility of terrorism inside the united states and how to combat it and uh, what they're doing is a physical exercise for a probable scenario event in training on how to deal with something Mm -hmm. In itself, I don't think it's going to, I think it's going to blow up. I can tell you that here in Oregon, 
We have the Oath Keepers are doing a big stakeout with the gold mines out here. It's a false flag. It's not real. The Oath Keepers are cool. The people that were doing the mining are breaking the law. They had structures on the mining claim, which is against the law. And their thing is the mining claim existed before BLM did. Now, the law is very clear about not having a structure on a gold mine claim. That is everywhere. These people are trying to fight a, uh, a law by saying, well, we were a, a licensed mine before BLM, so BLM can't be the one regulating us on it. Well, that may or not be true. What is true is that it's an armed encampment with a bunch of people trying to see who's got the bigger dick. And the problem, well, that's not going to work. And BLM doesn't want to go do that. What they want to do is either have those buildings removed or burn them down to the ground because they don't belong on on, on uh, state land. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is against the law. And so they're using the Oath Keepers, which is a right-winged organization and with good intent, I think. I, you know, I'm not an Oath Keeper, but I, I certainly can sympathize and appreciate they're willing to go to war on a one personal basis when our personal rights are being violated. In this case, I think they're being duped by a bunch of sleazeballs that are doing, trying to break the law and stir up trouble. And it wouldn't surprise me if it was an infiltration. I agree. Well, it seems to me like everything. Bundy Ranch originally, what that was all about is that China wanted to take over some utilities. And they owned the land, they wanted access to it, and some farmers did not want those solar panels in, so they made a big war around turtles. And in came the NRAPs and the chest beating. And the bottom line was China hired two point men, a governor or a guy that was running for governor and his father who was a senator. And they were both corrupt, and you'll notice you don't hear anything about them anymore, but they're gone down because they were the ones that were trying to start the war. And I'm so glad it didn't happen. And now we have a thing here in Oregon, which is similar and not. And this one is a bunch of good old boys trying to play a game. And it's stupid when we have real problems that we really need to be addressing. Right. Well, it seems to me like there's an escalation on so many different levels. I mean, everything seems to be breaking down in the, in the linear world. Well, I don't know what's going on. I, you know, I know some of the Oath Keepers. They're really sincere individuals. And some of them are L.A. cops that are afraid they're going to lose their pension because they're Oath Keepers. Mm -hmm. That's, they make you sign a paper when you retire that you have to be willing to pick up arms and go back out of retirement at any age against the American public should, you know, anarchy occur. And many of these people became Oath Keepers because they wouldn't sign that. And now their, their uh, pensions are in, are in jeopardy mm -hmm. because of that. It's a creepy, creepy law. Jade Helm itself is a, another false flag and mostly, in my opinion, a distraction against what's really the next problem. And what do you think the anarchy is going to be about? A pole shift? Well, it certainly sounds like it'll be a survival issue. It's going to be about a major extinction event, semi-extinction event occurring. That's what it's going to be about. Mm -hmm. And I think it's already set in motion. I mean, go ahead. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know where it's going to go. Just stay tuned on it. Right. Well, I think the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I get a little more data, and I get a little. Mm -hmm. more. Well, that's why I try to have you on as, as often as I can, and I so appreciate you being on the show. You know, everybody just loves you in chat, and everybody likes to hear you. So it's always it's always nice to have you on and talk about all this stuff. And of course, you don't hear it anyplace else, um, obviously. And you know, they can mask it all the way they want. You know, they're so busy in mainstream, you know, talking about BS instead of really talking about other things. Now, I'm not trying to be a fear monger or anything like that, but I do think it's important to understand what's happening in the cosmos and also how everything uh, you know affects us from from a universal perspective as well. You know, this is obviously something that's coming in. In some, in some form or another, we're, we're in into a very big shift in changing. That's right. And we should embrace, again, the difference between intent and intentionality. It's going to happen. So what you can do is embrace it as an opportunity for causing change in yourself. 
right? And I think the biggest thing is not to, for people to get sucked into the, the warp and the drama. And it's very and hard not fear, to do that. The yeah. fear part of it, yeah. Right. There's, there's so many obstacles. There's all these race wars spiking up and all this crap's going on and all, all this garbage. And it seems like the media fuels off that, obviously. But we really need to reset the boundaries and we really need to take our power back. I really... Well, I yeah, the fear that. part actually sells a lot in newspapers. Yeah. Well, people like drama. And I hate to say it, but so many people are into drama. Yeah. I remember when Charles Corral used to do his little thing uh, across America, a little glimpse of Americana. And I appreciated that spin. And I wished our media would go back to on the road with Charles Corral or even further. You know, there were Jack Kerouac and even before Jack, all of that was the positive part of things, not the negative, the glass being half full, not half empty or full of piss. Right. Well, yeah, it seems like it's really hard to find positive articles these days or anything that's uplifting to some degree. You can get real cynical. I think we, yeah, I think that what is uplifting for me is that I'm seeing that your, your, you know, your little uh, subscriber group are all getting it. Yep. That is exciting to realize that everybody is starting to wake up and get it and now it because the change occurs inside each of us it isn't me going out and making changes in the world if i want to change this world the way my great grandfather said it to rudolf steiner we are no longer at war in the physical world that if we wish to change this world we change ourselves and the world changes with us if i were an alien where would I hide in plain sight? I would be the fourth genome in the blood type. The war for Earth is going on metaphorically inside each of us. And so it's important that each of us begin that first step toward sovereignty. And that's the message I'd like to leave tonight, that we have an opportunity here. It's not about doom and gloom. It's about making those changes in ourselves. In that uh, War of the Worlds, where Klaatu is talking to the scientists, and the scientist says, don't give up on man. At his very weak worst, he excels and makes changes. That is why we were God's favorite. We do have the capacity to make the right choices. I agree. And it's also about information, though. If people have the right information, sure, they can make the right choices. There's no doubt about it. And I think that also people people shouldn't wait until the last minute. I mean, don't wait until we're right down to the wire insofar as what's going on with the transition before you make changes in your lifestyle or preparations. I mean, people really de- need to move their butts, if you ask me, and just start, you know, taking – Well, the reason back. they need to do that is that while their movement is probably not going to change anything, their children are watching them. And that's where the children learn how to do it. And right now, we have two generations with, without a family. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's that's um, very, very, I don't want to say disturbing, but it's unsettling to some degree. Well, that's why your actual decision making and walking your talk is so important, because that's how the children learn how to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. And hopefully they'll have free will and, and their minds will be honored to a point where they're not being brainwashed and, and contaminated with entrainment. That's my biggest concern is, is this mass mind control entrainment program, which is, is really trying to switch off the consciousness and, and the expansion of consciousness. That, to me, is a very big concern. Well, I don't know where we're going to go with this other than it's time to get up off the couch now and start the first step. I start agree. with water. Start with food. Those are good places to begin. Absolutely. In a sanctuary or some kind of a safe zone that you feel comfortable with. I you would know, say. what each of us actually has to offer is our joy. The thing that we would be doing, even if it wasn't about money, that is where each of us has value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. You know, what's really sad to me sometimes, Richard, is when I look at this planet, I, I see it as we will never see the planet the same again. In other words, things are getting morphed and changed, and, and sometimes it's through artificial design and, and other things which are planetary or universal. But but really, even when I was growing up, I mean, things are changing to a point where we'll never be the same again. Um, you know, the skies will never be really blue, at least not for a long time, um, you know, with all the chemtrails and things like that. Do you, ever, do you ever look at it like that? I am seeing things through a glass darkly. I have filters because of my beliefs. Unfortunately... <laughs> That limits what I do see 
and how I react to it. And that's where changing beliefs becomes a tool rather than a given driver of just assuming this is the way it is. You know, the reason I believe in Christianity and those kinds of things is because of where I was born. If I had been born in Syria, I would be a Muslim. And so a lot of our beliefs are arbitrary. And once you get that part, now you realize that your beliefs should not be God-given. They should be used as tools and may not be appropriate in certain situations. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, it's like an old hat. Sometimes you can't wear it. And you navigate beyond the belief systems to a higher level of what we call consciousness, in my opinion. So here we are. And what I'm going to say as a wrap up kind of thing is I think all of us need to start um, talking more to each other and uh, exchanging our ideas. We don't have to agree because that's God's will and realize that we're in such a limited space that the teachings of Christ, as I understand them, were a scene and the gospels of a scene philosophy are real clear on how you behave with yourself and others. And that's what I think is way more important than Christianity as a religion. I think there's going to be a last hope. I don't think that religions are going to last much longer. I think that spirituality is more important in that it is not what you do, but how you do it that makes you closer to the Lord. No, I agree. Totally. I mean, it's it's really about spiritual paths. Yeah, without a doubt. To me, religion has been a tool of control without a, you know, for centuries. It's been controlling and manipulating the mass collective. Can you imagine if we didn't have religion and structured religions, what what, uh, what the planet would have morphed into in evolution? It might have been a much better place. So, well, that was Greek. And they had a pantheon of gods. Mm-hmm. And what they did is they looked at the different energies in man from Jupiter and Mars and all of that, and they deified those aspects as archetypal. And then we had themes or stories that were running through us, and we were either possessed with a single theme, or we were complexed with more than one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, you have books out on the craft, right? I'm sorry? Do you have any books out on, on magic and the craft? I do have the Modern Alchemist. Pantheon is due out as a second follow-up on that, that is a book on tarot. It's got 22 chapters. Well, I, it yeah. is uh, discussed in the workbook part of using metaphor as a tool in uh, the relationship pantheon. There are 22 different paths or stories in the big city. And what you try to do is identify which ones you're participating with. And then you know how they end. Right. I really love that aspect of you. Your magical side is, is so intriguing and you have so much wisdom that I like to explore that more and more each time you're on the show. And of course, um, yeah, for people who want to read your articles, obviously let's steer them in the right direction. They want to get a hold of you and your website. Okay, so Richard Allen Miller will take you to my primary book site, which is oak-publishing.com. I'm actually self-published. A number of my books, or early books, were published by other uh, publishing houses like Inner Traditions and uh, uh, Inner Traditions and Thorson, Sphinx, Verlagen. But now I'm publishing all of my things under Oak. The Potential of Verbs is a Cash Crop was published by U- Acres USA. It just went out of print, and I'm going to pick that back up and reprint that at some point. Um, under oak again, just like I did the Modern Alchemist. The Modern Alchemist was originally Fane's Press. When he sold to Wiser, I took my book back and now am publishing it myself. Excellent. But I was part of Fane's Press. And Inner Traditions, my first three books, The Magical and Ritual Use of Herbs, The Magical and Ritual Use of Aphrodisiacs, and then The Magical and Ritual Use of Perfumes. And those books talk about the ritual uses of these uh, sacraments, which made them kept out of the Uniform Controlled Substance Act just by assigning rituals, made peyote and uh, psilocybin legal. Oh, excellent. That's interesting. Wow. So do you actually go through the rituals themselves or in, the, in your books? Oh, yeah. I, okay. Yeah, like sex magic and the mass of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, how to do it. The awesome. thought that occurs 
at the moment of climax happens. <laughs> well, that could be scary. You get the Pillsbury Doughboy or something. Oh, that's the emotional content. <laughs> it the structuring of water in you. Take and create a magical child. It's, it's really fascinating how we do manifest at will. That's why you have to be careful of your thoughts, huh? Well, that is. Man is responsible for the right. thoughts he chooses to entertain. There it is. It's as simple as that. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Well, Richard, we're just about out of time here. I just want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's Like I said, it's always a pleasure. It's an honor to have you on, and, and yeah. I have so much respect for who you are and what you do and your intellect and your mystical side. And I do want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. I hope you appreciated the information. Um, stay tuned for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mecky coming up next, of course, to sell you on to the night from down under, as they always do, with their excellent show here. And I think we have maybe just a few minutes here, plus or minus. I bet you we're just about out of time. Richard, is there any one last thing you'd like to say? If people have to stock up on anything at all, obviously water would be a good idea. Um, yeah, and- I, I, I would like to see all of you moving towards sovereignty. And you start with the physical world with water and food. Eventually, you'll want territorial things. You'll want uh, air, that kind of thing. But start with water. That's a good place to start. Make sure you have your own water. Right. And also a filtering system. And I think we touched base briefly on this before, but what's the best kind of filtering system you can recommend? Activated charcoal. I take a pair of pants, tie them at the bottom, fill it with charcoal, run my water through it, and then you can boil it uh, 10 minutes for every 1,000 feet. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And see you next week. Thanks again.